This episode of Beyond Contempt True Crime is sponsored by Himalaya Ashwagandha. I'm in the middle of selling my house right now, and I can't remember experiencing this level of stress, even during finals week in college. Stress, anxiety, worry, pressures, at home, at work, kids. There's so much that causes stress and anxiety these days. We're all looking for that natural way to take the edge off and protect our body and mind against it. Himalaya ashwagandha helps me navigate through daily stress and anxiety. Now, what is ashwagandha? The simple answer is, ashwagandha is an herb. In ancient times, ashwagandha was considered the king of Ayurvedic herbs and was used for a wide variety of conditions. In functional medicine today, we harness the power of ashwagandha, primarily to help our bodies adapt to the stress of modern-day life, so we can feel calm and balanced. Himalaya ashwagandha is organic, non-GMO, contains no binders or fillers, and is clinically studied for safety and efficacy. Stress less and find calm with Himalaya ashwagandha. The best part? Get 20% off your first purchase on Amazon with discount code CONTEMPT20. Check out the show notes for more details on this episode's sponsorship with Himalaya ashwagandha. This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon. For $1 per month, patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. There are many reasons why a true crime story grabs you. This one spoke to me because I identified with the victim, especially when I was her age. She enjoyed the outdoors and was athletic. She loved to work with her dog and train in the martial arts. She was unafraid to hike alone. She was determined, and she was a fighter. Most of all, she was more brave and capable in the face of serious danger than I could ever envision myself being. You're listening to Episode 31, Gary Michael Hilton. Meredith Hope Emerson was born on June 20, 1983, in Charleston, South Carolina. She and her brother grew up in both North Carolina and also in Longmont, Colorado. Meredith went to college at the University of Georgia and graduated with a degree in French. She was academically talented and was a member of Delta Epsilon Iota Honor Society and the French Honor Society. Meredith lived in the small city of Buford, Georgia, which is just northeast of Atlanta. Biologists say that form ever follows function, and Meredith's 5-foot, 4-inch athletic frame would often be found hiking, skiing, or snowshoeing. She was a martial artist and held a blue belt in Aikido and a green belt in Judo. Meredith loved animals and adopted a Labrador mix named Ella from a local shelter. She loved working with Ella and even trained her to be a therapy dog. Meredith was an all-American young 20-something who immediately found her footing after college graduation and landed a marketing job that was not far away from her apartment. Her family described her as being capable and feisty. She was well-liked, and had a large circle of friends. Life was good. On December 31, 2007, Meredith drove to Atlanta to bring in the new year with her friends. She didn't quite make it to midnight and drove back to her apartment in Buford, which she shared with roommate Julia Karenbauer. She woke up on that first day in 2008 and decided she wanted to take her dog Ella to Blood Mountain in Georgia to hike the trails. It was a nice day, and it was warmer than usual for Georgia. On the chalkboard in her apartment, Meredith scribbled down a quick message for her roommate. Take Anella hiking. Hope you had fun. The Appalachian Trail runs through Blood Mountain and has the highest peak elevation in the state of Georgia. Meredith arrived at Byron Herbert Reese Memorial Trailhead around 1 p.m., This was a popular attraction for day hikers, and it was her favorite trail to hike. Meredith and her boyfriend Steve had gotten into a fight over the phone 
prior to her arriving at the mountain. He called her back, but the call went directly to voicemail, because she must have started her hike. He left a message and apologized for the way he had acted. Later that night, Meredith did not return home. On January 2nd, she didn't show up for work. Meredith was always a conscientious and reliable person. So worry set in for the people in her circle of friends. Meredith's roommate, Julia, called her friends, boyfriend, and family to let them know that she never came home after hiking. Everyone went up to Blood Mountain. They found her car at the trailhead parking lot. The temperature had dropped the night prior, and her car was covered in snow. They alerted the park authorities that the 24-year-old woman was missing. They thought they might have a lost or injured hiker on their hands. The hiking community was very close in that area of Georgia, and they all banded together to search the trails for Meredith. Pieces of information came together quickly. A hiker stopped at the trailhead store and turned in several items he found on the trail, including water bottles, a dog leash, dog treats, a police baton, and a woman's barrette. The ground next to the dropped items had been disturbed, and deep down, he felt like something was wrong. Another hiker had reported that he saw Meredith on the trail on January 1st, walking with two dogs and an older man, who was missing several teeth and had a police baton on his belt loop. The young woman was carrying a leash. They were on the connector trail that linked the parking lot to the Appalachian Trail. The hiker thought maybe it was a father and daughter, At another point, one of the hikers had seen the older man again by himself. He looked agitated, as if he was waiting for the hiker to move along. Both hikers had chatted that the whole series of incidents was strange. Later, one of the hikers was watching the news, and he saw a report about the missing woman, and felt like it had to do with the young woman he had seen on the trail. He took that information to the police. Several police agencies joined forces to help with the case. They called the GBI in that night. Trails were searched. Helicopters were brought in. Meredith's cell phone records were checked, and there was no recent activity other than the last message from her boyfriend apologizing for the fight they had. They put together a description of the old man based on what the hikers on the trail had seen, and the media pushed it out to the world. The story was so heart-wrenching and compelling that it made national news. It was January 3rd. The person of interest had been announced, and a tip line was set up. The calls were nonstop. So many people knew this person of interest. He was unstable, they said. He was a drifter, they said. He slept in his van in national parks, they said. But no one could say where he was at that current moment. People had seen him and a tan dog at the same trailhead where Meredith had parked her car. John Tabor had turned on CNN and saw this person of interest on the screen. He was certain it was his ex-employee, 61-year-old Gary Hilton. Hilton worked for John Tabor for about a decade. John had a siding business, and Hilton's job was to drum up new customers. John also let Hilton live on one of his properties in Duluth, Georgia, rent-free. In 2007, John had noticed some changes with Hilton, and his behavior quickly degraded. Hilton was missing several teeth, and claimed that he used a pliers to pull them out. When John fired Hilton, Hilton threatened to kill him. This frightened John, so he called the police and reported the threat. One detail John communicated to authorities was that Hilton carried a variety of weapons, including a police baton. Hilton left John's property in September 2007 and hit the road in his van. John dialed the authorities to let them know who the person of interest was and gave them the make and model of the van he drove. A driver's license photo of Gary Hilton was sent out into the public. Gary Michael Hilton was born on November 22, 1946. His parents divorced when he was a young boy, but his mom was remarried by the time he turned nine. As a young teen, Gary was getting into serious trouble. 
He had bad feelings about his parents' divorce, and he blamed his stepdad, Nilo, for stealing his mother away, so he shot his stepdad. Nilo survived the incident, and 14-year-old Gary Hilton went to a mental hospital in Miami. They put him in foster care for a short stint. Then he dropped out of high school and enlisted in the army when he was 17. He was stationed in West Germany and trained to be a paratrooper. Hilton met his first wife in Germany and brought her back to the United States. He began hearing voices and was diagnosed with schizophrenia. The military gave him an honorable discharge, and he moved on with life. On the GI Bill, Hilton graduated from college and received his pilot's license. His first marriage didn't last long, and they divorced quickly. He was married two more times, and those marriages didn't work out either. His three marriages took place over the span of ten years, with his last divorce in 1979. The marriages never produced children. Hilton was arrested a few times for crimes like arson, theft, and battery, but he never did serious jail time. He worked with a lawyer who had represented him when he faced some of those charges. The lawyer wanted to make indie films, and Hilton was interested in helping. Hilton constructed a plot where a serial killer held a beautiful woman captive in a cabin, then released her into the woods, where he hunted and tried to kill her. The movie was called Dead Run. Hilton went from making this D-level movie to traveling around in his van to national parks with his golden retriever, Dandy. He really didn't relate to people, which is why he always had a dog. Now it was the 3rd of January, and Hilton dialed John Tabor from a restaurant to ask him for money. John lied and said he would leave him some money, but he was genuinely scared of Hilton now. He called his family and had them leave the house for their safety. Unfortunately, John waited a few hours after his call with Hilton before he went to the police with this information. This delay put the GBI behind the eight ball in the hunt for Meredith Emerson. It was January 4th, and Meredith had been missing since the 1st. Ella of the Labrador Mix was found 60 miles away from the Byron Herbert Reese Memorial Trailhead. She tried to walk into a Kroger's market in Cumming, Georgia. Someone in the parking lot was able to get Ella into their car, and a chip reader confirmed that the dog belonged to Meredith. At 6.45 p.m., a man placed a call to police from a quick trip in Cumming, Georgia. There was a man cleaning out his van, and he was the person of interest that had been posted all over the news. This person was tossing all kinds of stuff from his van into the dumpster. Seeing the man who had possibly kidnapped a young woman caused a massive adrenaline dump with a caller, and he was ready to take Hilton into custody himself. The 911 dispatcher had to constrain his enthusiasm, and luckily police arrived on the scene quickly. Gary Michael Hilton was in custody by 8 p.m. that night. Police recovered many items from the dumpster, including bloody fleece tops, a bloodstained piece of a car seatbelt, a bloodstained citation, metal chains, a blood-stained nylon rope, a woman's black leather wallet, which held Meredith Emerson's driver's license, and lastly, an Atlanta newspaper that featured Gary Hilton's picture and alerted him to the fact that police were hunting for him. After some DNA analysis, they confirmed that the blood in the van was Meredith's. Hilton was initially charged with kidnapping and bodily injury so authorities could hold him. He immediately lawyered up. Meredith was still missing, and given the circumstances, everyone's hope was deflated. So a deal was struck on January 7, 2008. They took the death penalty off the table, and Hilton agreed to tell authorities where Meredith was located. On December 31, 2007, Gary Hilton had pulled his van into the trailhead parking lot at Blood Mountain. He was down to his last $40 and desperately needed to find more money. The next day he was scoping out various marks. He targeted Meredith Emerson because she was a woman, and she was alone. But Meredith wasn't Hilton's first choice. He had also been watching another woman on the trail. But he gave up on her. 
she was hiking on some of the popular trails that were more populated. And he never found a time when there weren't other hikers around. Hilton walked up to Meredith and used his dog, Dandy, as a way to strike up a conversation with her. After a short while, it was clear that she was fit, and he couldn't keep up with her. Meredith dropped Hilton on the trail, but he knew that he would see her again when she hit the switchback that lay ahead. When she came back into his view, he jumped out and pulled a knife on her. He demanded her ATM card and PIN number. Instead of rolling over in fear, as Hilton had predicted, Meredith fought him. She grabbed for his weapon and kicked him several times. They were in a wild tussle, and Meredith slipped, giving Hilton the upper hand. He hit her in the head with his baton. In the continued struggle, Hilton dropped his baton, so he punched her several times and broke her nose. Meredith was so dazed, she submitted to him, and Hilton was able to take control. He actually hit her so hard that his hand swelled up because it was broken. They headed down the trail when Hilton realized he had dropped the baton. So he pulled Meredith off the trail, gagged her, zip-tied her hands, and tied her to a tree. He headed back to the area where he attacked her, but it was too late. A hiker had already stopped at the spot and picked up the dropped items. Hilton went back to Meredith and took her to the parking lot. He put her in his van, snapped on a tight chain collar, and locked it with a padlock. Hilton got on the road and started driving. Meredith was in a terrifying situation, but even so, she advocated for her dog. She convinced Hilton to turn around, go back to the trailhead, and pick up her dog, Ella. At 6.30 p.m. on January 1st, Hilton, Meredith, and the two dogs were in the van, heading towards an ATM. Over the next several days, Hilton drove her around, going from bank to bank, trying to extract money from various cash machines. He attempted a withdrawal from the Appalachian Community Bank in Blairsville, Georgia. The transaction did not go through. At 9.30 p.m., he made seven more attempts at the Bank of America in Gainesville, Georgia. The same thing happened. The transactions would not go through. Meredith continued to give him incorrect PIN numbers. It was the only card she had to play, being padlocked inside his vehicle. What she didn't know was that she wasn't the first person to find herself inside Hilton's van, but she was the first person to not give him the correct PIN number, which was why she was still alive. At 8.30 p.m. on January 2nd, he tried to withdraw money from Regions Bank in Canton, Georgia. The PIN number wasn't working. Meredith refused to give in. On January 3rd, he called his old employer, John Tabor, to ask for money. On January 4th, Hilton told Meredith that he was going to let her go. Hilton's van was camped by a stream, and a lawn care truck got stuck nearby. The driver of that truck walked towards Hilton to ask him for help. Hilton immediately jumped up to meet the driver and keep him away from his van, since Meredith was inside. The driver mentioned he placed a call to police to help get the truck unstuck, which spooked Hilton. He jumped in his van and took off. Finally, Hilton found a new location and backed his van in. A cop drove by, and he waved at the officer while he waited for him to pass. He took Meredith out of the van and tied her to a tree in Dawson Forest Wildlife Management Area. Hilton strolled back to the van to make himself a cup of coffee. He grabbed his tire iron, and he headed back to Meredith. He struck her several times in the head, which caused her death, and was confirmed by the autopsy. Hilton decapitated her post-mortem, washed her down with Clorox bleach, and buried her under leaves and brush. He left Ella behind and drove off, only to be apprehended hours later. There were so many close calls and missed opportunities to save Meredith. The outside world did not act with the sense of immediacy that was required to save her life. Hikers were not far away from the tree Meredith was chained to when Hilton backtracked to pick up his dropped weapon. John Tabor hesitated for several hours after his call from Hilton before he contacted the GBI. 
Meredith was chained up in his van when Hilton placed that call from the restaurant. The banks did not immediately call authorities back after all the failed attempts to withdraw money. Now that law enforcement knew where Meredith's body was located, a trusted DNR officer helped secure the crime scene. He remembered Hilton because horseback riders had complained about him. The DNR officer could not find any crime that Hilton had officially broken, so there was nothing he could do about it. The day they found Meredith was very traumatic for him, and he described Gary Hilton as being someone who was truly evil. Hilton tried to garner some modicum of sympathy and told his public defender that he started killing people after he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. The statement was never confirmed. On January 30th, 2008, Gary Hilton admitted his guilt in murdering Meredith Emerson, and the next day was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 30 years. This was a hard compromise for investigators to make, but they wanted the Emerson family to have some closure, which was why they made the deal removing the death penalty from the equation. What they banked on was the other serious evidence that was found in Gary Hilton's van implicated him in other murders. Investigators were playing the long game, and they believed that Hilton would face the death penalty in other states. Hilton's golden retriever still needed a home, and one of the investigators from the public defender's office graciously adopted the dog. There was so much public disdain for Gary Hilton that his dog, Dandy, received death threats. His new owner renamed him Danny. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Thank you to Best Fiends for sponsoring this episode of Beyond Contempt True Crime. Do you like puzzle games? Do you like to be entertained? Well, I like both of those things. That's why I really enjoy playing Best Fiends. It's a laid-back puzzle game that you play on your phone. It's a great game to play when I need to take a break from writing true crime scripts. And if my writing for this podcast is even half as creative as the characters in this game, then I know I've made the big time. And you don't even need to be tethered to Wi-Fi because you can play without an internet connection. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free in the Apple App Store or on Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Hi, everyone. I wanted to tell you about BetterHelp Online Counseling. It's an affordable service where you can connect with one of their licensed professional therapists. You can find counselors that specialize in anxiety, depression, family conflicts, trauma, and self-esteem. I work from home and rarely leave my house, so I really appreciate that you can communicate with your counselor from the privacy of your own home. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. You can start talking with your counselor in less than 24 hours. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash beyondcontempt. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash beyondcontempt. Now, back to the show. Cheryl Hodges Dunlap was a 46-year-old nurse who worked at the FSU Student Health Center. She also taught Sunday school. The divorced mother of two children lived alone with her beloved dog, Buddy, in Crawfordville, Florida. On December 1, 2007, she went to Target to do some shopping and was recognized by one of her old colleagues. They had a quick chat, and she left the store around 2.30 p.m. An hour later, Cheryl's car was seen by an officer at the Apalachicola National Park's entrance off the highway. The officer stopped to see if the driver was in trouble, but there was no one in the car. A few other officers ran across her car several hours later, but they arrived at the same conclusion. The next day, Cheryl failed to show up to teach Sunday school. On Monday, she missed work for her nursing job. 
Her daughter-in-law called the police to report her missing. Cheryl was a devoted member of the evangelical Christian River of Life Church. Many of her church friends formed a search party and found her white Toyota Camry on December 4th, parked outside the National Park's entrance off the highway. The left rear tire of Cheryl's car had been punctured. They immediately called the police. When authorities checked her house, they were hit with a stench of dog urine and feces. Her small dog, Buddy, had not been let outside in a few days. There was no sign of a struggle. It was baffling because Cheryl loved her dog and would never abandon or neglect him. When they checked bank records, someone had used her ATM card right after she went missing. Surveillance videos captured a masked man who was making withdrawals with her ATM card. Authorities even spent a week staking out the cash machines, but the perpetrator never returned. 180 people formed a search party and explored the woods by her car on December 18th, but nothing turned up. It was deer season, and hunters headed out into the forest on December 19th. Two hunters were walking through the forest when their dog started barking and latched onto a scent. The dogs led the hunters to a spot where vultures were feeding on a deceased human. The head and hands were missing, but were eventually recovered in a fire pit at a campsite in the forest. DNA testing revealed the human was Cheryl Dunlap. Her body was so decomposed that the medical examiner could not determine a cause of death. Gary Hilton was easily linked to this crime. When he was cleaning out his van, after he murdered Meredith Emerson, he placed Cheryl's boots in the dumpster, which were retrieved during evidence collection. They also found her DNA on Hilton's boots and on a sleeping bag. There were reports that Hilton was camping in that area where Cheryl went missing. A ranger had issued him a citation for camping in an unauthorized area, for driving on a closed road, and for having an expired license. Hilton was asked to leave, which he did. On February 2, 2011, the jury selection began for Cheryl's murder trial. The case was solid, if not overwhelming. The witness testified that he and his wife saw Cheryl alone on the trail on December 1, 2007. She was reading a book, which explained how she ended up in the forest after shopping at Target. The prosecution believed Cheryl was stalked by Hilton, much like Meredith was, and she was held captive for two days as he made the ATM withdrawals. The defense claimed Hilton suffered from traumatic brain injury, was abused as a child, and had antisocial personality and schizoaffective disorders. The jury was unmoved, and Hilton was found guilty for the murder of Cheryl Dunlap. For the sentencing phase of the trial, the prosecution could use details from Meredith Emerson's case to show how evil and unredeemable Hilton was. In April 2011, it only took the jury just over an hour to determine that Gary Hilton deserved the death penalty. This wasn't the end of Gary Hilton's legal trouble. There was one more case that authorities were able to tie him to. John and Irene Bryant were a rare couple. They were happily married 80-somethings who were still healthy and fit enough to enjoy hiking. They retired in North Carolina because they loved to hike the trails there. John had legitimate credentials as he had traversed the entire Appalachian Trail. On October 21, 2007, the Bryants went day hiking in the Pishka National Forest. Irene's sister called frequently and was concerned that she had not heard from them for an entire week. The Bryants' son, Bob, lived in Austin. He was so worried that he booked a flight to North Carolina to check on his mom and dad. When he arrived at their house, his parents were gone along with their packs and their car. He placed a call to report them missing. The Bryant's Red Ford Escape was found parked east of Yellow Gap Road. Phone records revealed that a 911 call was placed from their cell phone, but the call dropped because of the weak signal. 84-year-old Irene Bryant was found 25 yards from her car. The perpetrator hit her several times in the head with a blunt object. Her forearm and fingers were fractured, likely from attempting to shield herself from the blows. 
Now Bob Bryant and his sister Holly, who lived in Florida, had to make plans for their mother's funeral, even though their father John was still missing. Several months later, on February 2, 2008, 80-year-old John Bryant was finally found 100 miles away in Franklin, North Carolina. He had been shot in the head with a 22 Magnum. Law enforcement determined the perpetrator kidnapped John and used his ATM card to make withdrawals. On October 22, 2007, there was a $300 withdrawal from the People's Bank in Ducktown, Tennessee. ATM security footage showed a slim man in a yellow raincoat using the Bryant's card. His face was not discernible, but his body type was consistent with Gary Hilton's. In April 2013, Hilton was sentenced to life without parole in North Carolina for the murder of John and Irene Bryant. There were a few other victims for which Hilton has been implicated in their murders, but this has never been proven. Judy Smith was a 50-year-old nurse and mother. She was newly married and was traveling with her husband, Jeffrey, on one of his business trips in 1997. Judy arrived at the airport with her husband and realized she forgot her identification. She went home to retrieve her license, took a later flight to Philadelphia, and met up with her husband at the hotel. The next day, she went sightseeing while Jeffrey attended his conference. They hung out in the evenings and had dinner each night. This was the system they decided on for the week. One day, Jeffrey saw his wife in the morning, but she did not return to the hotel room that night. He called local hospitals and searched the streets for her in a cab. It was all he could do while he waited for authorities to take action, since police required a 24-hour waiting period before they would accept a missing persons report. Judy was seen in many places, Easton, Philly, Jersey, and Asheville. On September 7, 1997, Judy was found not too far from Asheville, North Carolina, wrapped in a blanket and placed in a shallow grave in the Pishka National Forest. Her wedding ring was still on her finger, and her cash had not been taken. Judy's wallet, which contained her license, was missing. She had been stabbed to death. Her husband was briefly looked at after the murder, but he was not a suspect in the case. His alibi checked out as he was attending a business conference. By all reports, they had a good relationship. Plus, he was so morbidly obese that there was no way he could have hiked to the crime scene. Unfortunately, Jeffrey died a decade after Judy's murder. There were different theories as to what happened to Judy Smith. Some think she traveled voluntarily because she wanted out of her marriage. But others think she crossed paths with Gary Hilton. 26-year-old Rosanna Miliana disappeared on December 7, 2005, while hiking in Bryson City, North Carolina. She was a young woman who suffered from a bipolar disorder. She wanted to go hiking, so she hopped on a bus in South Florida, which dropped her off in North Carolina. Rosanna's body was discovered beaten to death. Two years after her disappearance, a shopkeeper reported to the police that she came into the store with an older man. They purchased some hiking gear. The man told her that he was a traveling preacher, and the young woman seemed nervous. The perpetrator later took Rosanna's ATM card and tried to make withdrawals. 27-year-old Michael Scott Lewis was found in Tomoka State Park near Ormond Beach, Florida, on December 6, 2007. His torso and legs were found, but his head was never recovered. Michael's firebird was found in the parking lot of his apartment. The keys were in the ignition, and the car contained two guitars and his laundry. Gary Hilton tried to appeal his sentence, but it was delayed. In 2016, Florida Supreme Court decided that the death penalty was unconstitutional. The state is still deciding if they are going to uphold his death sentence. Hilton remains on death row in Union Correctional Institution in Railford, Florida. After Meredith Emerson's murder, true crime writer Fred Rawson was writing a story for Hustler magazine and filed an open records request for photos from the crime scene. Some of these photos included her naked and dismembered body. The state of Georgia refused the request. Politician Jill Chambers crafted a bill 
that would allow the state to not fulfill requests that included nude crime scene photos. Jill was adamant that Meredith was not allowed to give her permission for those photos and deserved to have her privacy maintained. Fred Rawson claimed he checked Georgia's Open Records Act to see what he was allowed to ask for. He said he was unaware of the condition of her body at the time of his request. He wanted the photos to understand what happened and to verify if what Hilton told police was accurate. On March 29, 2012, the Meredith Emerson Memorial Privacy Act was signed into law, which prevented certain types of crime scene photos from being released to the public without the authorization from a judge. Meredith was awarded her black belt posthumously at her memorial service by her instructor at AKF Athens Martial Arts. Meredith's roommate Julia founded a nonprofit called The Right to Hike. Through it, she created a scholarship fund in Meredith's name. They also held fundraisers that purchased emergency trail phones and supported hiker safety initiatives. Julia created a run walk event called Ella's Run, which celebrated Meredith's life. The event included a 5K run and a one mile walk. Dogs were, of course, invited and encouraged to take part. After almost a decade, they held the final event in 2017. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for links to the sources and music used in this episode. Research, writing, editing, audio production, and music scoring were performed by me. If you like the show, please leave me a favorable review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.